Hello everyone, Omi Tofo. Today in this session, I would like to discuss with you about a very popular topic that discuss in this modern world, psychology. Basically, when we mention about the term psychology, most people were directly related to mind and human behavior. There are many psychologists that analyze the human's mind and their behavior, which we can easily find these theories in the website. However, today I would like to share with you the relationship between Buddhism and psychology and what are the perspectives of psychology in Buddhism. So what is psychology in our normal understanding? Many people will say that it is the science of the mind, which includes investigation into the mental activities of human life. And according to the Western world, Psychology originated from medical science, philosophy, natural science, religion, education, and sociology. And in today's society, psychology is applied to even a broader area, such as education, industry, business, healthcare, national defense, law, politics, sociology, science, arts, and even sports. Psychology examined the mental functions of the mind and the modes of human's behavior. So to normal people understanding, psychology is the study of what the mind function that leads to the human's behavior. And Western psychologists use it to study the development of personality and how this personality shapes the individual behavior. And these are the understanding by most people. If we generate out the concept of psychology in the Western world or the modern society basically ties into the function of mind. Many Western psychologists quoted their understanding or their experience about psychology and mind such as Sigmund Freud, he said that the mind is like an iceberg. It floats with one-seventh of its bulk above water. They are also saying that psychology is a subject of life, death, and in between. Psychology is a very unsatisfactory science. Psychology is describing things which everyone knows in language, which no one understands. So my is a complicated thing. Psychology is a complicated studies. So in this session, let's explore what is psychology in Buddhism. How Buddhists think about psychology. And did the Buddha ever talk about psychology during his lifetime? Buddhism and psychology. Basically, Buddhism deeply understands the psychological nature of human beings and has developed effective treatment methods. Buddhism does not only study about the human mind. The most important is that how do we treat this mind? According to Avatamsaka Sutra, our perceptions of the three realms arises from the mind, and so do the twelve links of dependent origination. Birth and death originated from the mind, and they extinguished when the mind is put in rest. This sutra highlighted that all things, even the birth and death, actually arises from our perceptions that create from the mind. The studies of mind in Buddhism is sophisticated. It describes the nature and functions of the mind and instruction on how to search for, abide with, and refine it. As I mentioned earlier, mind is complicated. In this complicated mind, it arises a lot of thoughts. How do we manage this mind? How do we understand this mind? So, we have highlighted that mind is a very important factor in our life. 
not just this life, but also future life? And what is the Buddhism view of mind? Buddhism interprets everything in this world as the manifestations of our own mind. It investigates and analyzes humans' problems at the most fundamental level. It goes into the most basic thoughts in our mind, and from there it analyzes out. And through this analyze, we understand that why we have these reflections of all kinds of things. All the Buddha's teachings deal with the mind, as shown in the multitude of sutras and sastras. The mind-only schools, which is also called the Yokachara schools, is the closest counterparts to today's psychology. The Yokachara's texts are used to explain Buddhist psychology. According to the Yokachara's teachings, the mind consists of eight consciousness which clearly indicates that it is not made of a single element, but instead a complex interaction of factors. These factors are the functions of the six sensory organs of the human body, which are the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, body, and mental function, plus the consciousness which constantly grabs the self, which called the manas, and the alaya consciousness, which is the store consciousness, referred to as the master of the mind. Alaya consciousness collects and stores all four karmic seeds of the mind in the ongoing cycle of birth and death of all sentient beings. Which means this is the mind or consciousness that leads us in the endless rebirth. To a Buddhist, the self at this moment reflects everything accumulated from the past. All the experience that we have in the past, or even till now, it will go into our alaya consciousness. It will store in there, and from there, when we see anything, immediately this storage of the experience will reflect out, and this will come out with our behavior. So the three realms are a mere manifestation of the mind. So are the immeasurable of dharmas. All phenomena in this life and in the universe are nothing but mirror image imprinted on our mind through the eight consciousness. What does this mean? This means that everything we see around us, including ourselves, is the manifestations from our mind. It is the memory that store in our mind that comes out when we interact with these external factors, and immediately we are able to retrieve out the information that we have in the past life. So all this basically creates out from our mind. In realities, all things constantly change in a cycle of formation, abiding, destructions, and emptiness. Our thoughts and ideas also arise, abide, change, and disappear instantaneously in the circle of birth and death. All things arises means that everything that we encounter, we see, we smell, we taste, we thought, actually arise because that this memories is in our mind. And because of these memories in our mind, we are able to judge from our experience whether we like it or we don't like it. However, all things in this world basically has to follow the rules of the formation, abiding, destruction, and emptiness. In the end, everything changed. In the end, everything disappeared. Everything in this universe can only be found in perceptions and interpretation. So it's a concept, it's a thought in our mind, comes out from our past experience, and we interpret it out. Due to the influence of ignorance we carry with us from the past, we are prone to making judgments that result in negative feeling. Our ignorance leads us to what we think, 
at the same time, we can make a decision on what you think. The development of our true mind and its wisdom relies on the diligence practice of upholding the precepts, developing concentrations, and increasing awareness and insight. All of us have a true mind. As according to the Buddha, all of us has Buddha nature. And this Buddha nature basically is the true mind. This process transforms a diluted mind into the true mind and is described in Buddhism as converting consciousness into wisdom. In Chinese, called Zuan Shi Chen Zhi. Consciousness carries the philosophical baggage of past experiences. We have all kinds of past experiences. However, all these past experiences, most of them are diluted mind. Are we willing to transform this diluted mind into a true mind? The wisdom produced from the true mind is the therapy or treatments that humans can use to resolve internal conflicts within their mind, to transcend suffering in this lifetime, and to break from the circle of birth and death in coming. Whether we want to continue to hold on to the diluted mind that's stored in our eight consciousness, or do we want to transcend this diluted mind into a true mind by using the wisdom as the medicines to treat our diluted mind. And in Buddhism, there are couples of allegories that describe the mind, such as the root cause of human suffering and other problems is identified as the mind. All our feelings, regardless of suffering or happiness, trouble or in ease, actually is defined by the mind. In the Buddha's teaching, he instructed sentient beings on how to recognize the mind, calm the mind, and handle the mind. So it's not just into understanding the mind. The most important is that how do we calm this mind in order to manage this deluded mind? The mind leads to a person's behavior. If a person's mind is pure, all of his or her thoughts, speech, and action will also be pure. If a person's mind is impure, then what he or she hears and sees will be impure. Therefore, it is said as one sutra. When the mind is impure, the being is impure. When the mind is pure, the being is pure. So everything in us basically comes from our mind. However, we are able to make a decision. What type of minds do we want to? And according to Buddhism, all the pains and suffering in this world are created by the mind. The truth is, our mind will originally capable of embracing everything just like the Buddha's mind. However, we don't believe it. How the Buddha described about the mind about 1,500 years ago? The Buddha says, the mind is like a monkey, difficult to control. The mind is as quick as lightning and thunder, as fast. It changes all the time. The mind is like a wild deer, chasing after sensory pressure all the time. We, have, we are keep chasing and chasing for a lot of things. It's not because of the things. It's because of our mind. The mind is like a robber, stealing our virtues and merits. We are unable to control our mind. The mind keeps stealing away our merits from us. We have been a good person, but we are unable to control our evil mind. The mind is like an enemy that inflicts suffering upon us. The mind is like a servant to various irritations. The mind is like a master who has the highest authority. In this three commands, mind is enemy, mind is servant, Mind is master. Who
who is the enemy, who is the servant, and who is the master? How do we able to reduce our suffering? How are we able to hold back the authority to manage our mind? The mind is like an ever flowing spring, never stops. The mind is like an artist who paints, paint whatever they want to. The mind is like space and is without limits. We can think all kind of things every minute, every seconds. There's no limit in our mind. It's so broad and empty. So besides understanding about the mind, the Buddha also taught us how to purify the mind. According to Buddhism, the real illness is the real illness in our mind. Our mind makes us ill. At the same time, we mix our minds ill. Hence, Buddha taught us various of ways to treat our illness mind. One, a calm mind is the antidote to a busy mind. We are very busy all the time. The mind is all filled with things. In order for us to be concentrated, we need to cultivate a calm mind. Two, a compassionate mind is the antidote to a wicked mind. Sometimes we have anger. Sometimes we are unkind. Because we have all kinds of unwholesome thoughts come out. How do we overcome it? Very simple. Cultivate a compassion mind. Care for people. Think about people. Do something for people. Three, a trusting mind is the antidote to a doubtful mind. We're always in the worries of other people. We do not trust people. Because we do not trust, we feel unsafe. In order to overcome the unsafe, uncomfortable feeling, we have to cultivate a trusting mind. Four, a true mind is the antidote to a deluded mind. Try to have a simple mind. The Buddha's mind is a simple mind. The true mind are able to remove, reduce the deluded mind that cause us to be un. Pleasant. Five, an open mind is the antidote to a narrow mind. Sometimes we are not a broad thinking person. We also always think in a narrow way. We are unable to open our mind to others. In order to have good affinity, it is important to have a open mind. Six, a balanced mind is the antidote to a Fragment mind. We need to balance our mind daily because every day we have different things coming to us. It's part and pieces spreading around. In order to put all these things that spreads around back to us, we have to balance our mind. We have to try ourselves to balance our body, speech, and mind. Seven, an enduring mind is the antidote to an impermanent mind. Our mind change a lot. Everything change all the time. A lot of people unable to deal, endure the impermanence, the changes. We have to understand and accept that changing is part of this phenomenal world, including ourselves. We change all the times too. We have to be patient. We have to endure the changes because this is the nature of this universe. Eight, a unattached mind is the antidote to an impulsive mind. We have to learn to let go. There are a lot of things that we do not want to let go. But in truth, there's no choice for us. We are unable to stop death, but we are unable to stop old age. So we are, our minds always trouble with things that we are unable to control. However, if we are able to cultivate an unattached mind, we are able to 
see through the truth and let go when it's time to let go. We have discussed a lot about Buddhism and mind. So, is there a relationship and impact of Buddhism to the modern psychology? Any relationship between them? In here, I would like to introduce a few psychologies that actually used the teachings of Buddhist psychology in their own studies. For example, Sigmund Freud, a Western psychiatrist. He developed the theories and practice of psychoanalysis. He was perhaps the first researchers who explored the role of the human unconscious in the history of Western psychology. The unconscious that explored by him has actually been taught in Buddhism thousands of years ago and further explored by many great Yokachara schools master, such as Venerable Master Xuan Zhuang. Another psychologist named as Kao Yong. He was very knowledgeable about Eastern philosophies and spiritual practices, such as Buddhism, Chan, and Yoga. He was inspired by this teaching, and he divided the human psychic into three levels. Conscious, individual unconscious, and collective unconscious. These are also the core teachings in the Yokachara schools. After the World War II, humanistic psychology was developed and advanced by Abraham Maslow. He suggested that human needs can be divided into five stages. The highest stage is self-actualization. He borrowed the concepts such as correct feeling and enlightenment from Buddhism to interpret his ideal states of self-actualization. Another psychologist named Eric Fromm. He has a keen interest in and deeply understanding of Chan Buddhism. He spoke highly of Buddhism and its spiritual aspect characteristic by loving kindness and compassion, and an extreme selflessness elevating all sentient beings to bliss. He taught that altruism in the form of sacrificing oneself from others is the correct medicine for healing sickness in Western society. This thought of altruism basically as the Bodhisattva's mind mentality. As a branch of humanistic psychology, transpersonal psychology developed in the 1960s and has broadened the boundaries of traditional psychology by integrating Buddhist philosophy and other spiritual practices with Western philosophy. Modern scientific methods are used to explain many of today's concrete psychological problems, whereas traditional Buddhist psychology has often been more generalizing. So a lot of modern or Western psychology basically try to image their thinking, their understanding with the Buddhist psychology. And Buddhism has been in this world for more than 1,500 years ago. The Buddha has been talking about the function of mind during his time. He has analyzed, and most important, he taught us how to manage this mind. So, in conclusion, Buddhist psychology identifies the source of all suffering. This is the most important part. We have to identify what are sufferings, what is the cause of suffering, and most important, how to end the suffering. Buddhism shows us the meaning of life and guides all sentient beings to search the deeper power of mind through the eliminations of greed, anger, 
and ignorance from within. The practices in Buddhism, if pursued freely and diligently, prevent any occurrence or reoccurrence of psychological illness. Buddhist psychology is to tell us what is the meaning of life. And it knows that all our sufferings, our unpleasant feelings, comes from the three poisons, greed, anger and ignorance. Through the understanding of mind, we have, have the ability to eliminate it if we practice diligently. This is something that what the Buddhas want to guide us, heal ourselves. Buddhism aids people in creating both physical and mental health so that they can lead both joyful and fulfilling lives. That's the ultimate goal. Buddhist psychology represents an important and comprehensive science of mental health. By adopting to the needs of people, Buddhist psychology along with other modalities will meet the demands of our time by providing solutions to humans' problems and improving our well-being. In order to make this world in peace, in order to make our life a better life, a more happier life, we have to understand our mind. We keep asking for people about peace, about happiness, but actually we are the one that did not bring in peace and happiness in us. So in Buddhist psychology, it let us understand about our mental health. We start from ourselves. We start from within ourselves, knowing our mind, the function of our mind. How do we transcend our mind? How do we lead our mind to a happy mind? And most important, lead our mind to know the true mind, which is the Buddha's mind. If all beings are able to explore out their Buddha's mind, this world will change. This world will be a better world. This world will be a more harmonized world. People will treat people equally. People will respect the different races, the different gender, the different age. There's no conflicts because through Buddhist psychology, we look into ourselves first rather than looking into other people. So I hope that through this short session introducing about Buddhist psychology, we are able to look into ourselves. What is our mind function? Why am I have this delusion thoughts? Why am I not happy? And through this feeling of unhappiness, we understand that we need to do something. We need to transcend our suffering mind, our deluded mind, our unpleasant mind into the wisdom mind, into the true mind, into the Buddha mind. And I hope that by understanding Buddhist psychology, all of us will live happily in this world, even though there are many challenges that we are facing now. There are many things that we are unhappy there are so many unfair things happen in this world. But if we want the external factors to change, it is better for us to look into ourselves, change ourselves first. From changing ourselves, are we able to influence other people? Are we able to influence a community? Are we able to influence this world? So through these short sessions, I hope that all of us are able to explore our true mind and one day we achieve to the path of pure land. Thank you very much and Omitofo.